This is Twit. All right, we're going to start with some news that's very recent, actually. Early this morning, Ethereum saw a monumental upgrade to its software architecture. Many of you, you probably heard have been referring to this as the merge. People looking for good news in crypto might actually have a moment to make them happy right now. It's a cause for celebration, definitely a big deal to people who are close to Ethereum. And joining us to help us understand the merge and what it means for crypto is David Yaffe Bellany from the New New York Times. Welcome to the show, David. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, it's really good to get you here. So first of all, let's uh, let's tackle the main differences between proof of work, which is the framework that powered Ethereum before the merge, and then of course proof of stake, which is the way that it is going forward. What are the? Mm -hmm. If you had to summarize this for someone who's trying to follow along, because I know you know in the crypto world there there's a lot of definitions and everything that can kind of fly over people's heads. How would you explain the differences? Why is this better? Mm -hmm. So to understand the differences, it's it's first important to think about the problem that crypto is trying to solve. Um, it's trying to create a, a means of sending money that doesn't involve any type of intermediary or gatekeeper. You know, in a traditional transaction, a bank would verify that one entity has enough money to uh, send it to another entity. Um, in, in, in crypto, you have to find another technique to verify transactions. Um, and the original solution that people came up with was this system called proof of work, which is basically a bunch of computers racing to solve cryptographic puzzles that in the process kind of confirm that you know trans transactions are legitimate. But it's a super um, energy guzzling process, you know, running all those computers um, consumes a huge amount of electricity. Um, and so that's one of the main reasons that people have been drawn to this alternative called proof of stake, where instead of this computational race among bunches of different computers, um, you have a kind of lottery where people put up money, you're sort of entered into the lottery, and then you're chosen at random to, to validate a transaction rather than having to kind of race for that opportunity. Um, and in both systems, a reward comes with that privilege of validating a transaction. You're paid a small amount of cryptocurrency um, as payment for that. Is everybody who's who's really steeped in the world of Ethereum uh, in particular, like, is the majority of, of, of people excited about this? Or are there people who are like, you know, I really don't want this to happen? I don't know. I, I, I hear a lot of positivity about it, but I have to imagine there's people who feel like this uh, shouldn't happen. What, what are those reasons? Yeah, I mean, the Ethereum community is mostly thrilled about this. This is sort of widely considered a kind of good news moment for crypto and what's been a sure. generally pretty grim year. Um, but yes, there are there are there are groups that are opposed to it. Um, I mean, mostly groups that are financially invested in that proof of work mm. system. So crypto miners who've built, you know, huge warehouses full of computers that are running on proof of work. Um, now suddenly a means of income has been snatched away from them as Ethereum transitions to this new proof of uh, uh, stake consensus mechanism. Um, and so there's been pushback from, from those groups. There's also been pushback from, you know, Bitcoiners who are sort of philosophically opposed to Ethereum for various reasons. Um, there have been dissenting voices that have said, wait, why are we doing something this risky that could kind of upset the whole industry if it were to go wrong? You know, the common comparison you hear is that it's like changing a plane's engine mid-flight, that that's the level <laughs> of risk that's involved here. <laughs> and it and it has not been a short time coming either. This is a transition that's been in the works for quite a while. I mean, largely because of the complexity that you're talking about. Um, what has it taken behind the scenes to actually get to this point? I mean, when I think of an airplane changing engines mid flight, like that's a <laughs> that's a massive undertaking. This obviously sounds incredibly complex and complicated. Um, how how did this actually happen then? How are they able to pull this off? Sure. Um, so one one complexity that made it take so long is that Ethereum is not a company. This wasn't some like behind closed doors project. It wasn't like Apple, you know, unveiling the newest iPhone. Ethereum is a huge open source project where engineers around the world are working on constantly. And so it was this kind of like motley group of people in different countries that were collaborating on this. And there are certainly advantages to that type of process. But um, without a kind of top down authority, things can also take a lot 
lot longer. Um, so that's sort of one kind of high level reason that it's taken so long. And then also there's just a high level of technological complexity. Um, these developers had to build an entirely new blockchain, which is the kind of public ledger where cryptocurrency transactions are recorded. They had to test to make sure that it was working properly. And then they had to figure out how to merge it. That's why this process is called the merge with the existing Ethereum blockchain. And that's what happened uh, yesterday, a few minutes before midnight West Coast time. Yeah, yeah. So obviously very early on in the actual kind of new era of Ethereum and how Ethereum works. Um, but there's always the risk. I mean, there's still a risk, right? Like, I mean, the merge happened officially and everybody was like, it, it almost like to a certain degree for me, it kind of feels like Y2K. It's like, we think that there's a possibility that something <laughs> bad might happen. We'll flip the switch and we'll see. And at the end of the day, you know, with Y2K, it really didn't end up being that big a deal. Easy for me to say, I didn't do all the work behind the scenes, but here we have this merge that yes, has happened, but are there still risks? Like, is there some scenario where we go, Whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> we didn't account for that. Uh, this is this is a bad deal. I think most of the kind of short term worst case scenarios we already know now we've kind of avoided yeah. um, that would have become clear sort of in the immediate aftermath of the merge. Um, it's certainly possible that bugs, glitches, hacking vulnerabilities will be discovered in the next few weeks. Um, but if you speak with the developers behind Ethereum, they're very confident that those are things they'll be able to address kind of case by case and that won't have any sort of system wide impact. There are kind of longer term concerns about what type of effect this would have on the kind of crypto community. Um, one fear is that it could create more centralization, um, which of course is a big mm -hmm. kind of uh, something that crypto, the crypto people want to avoid. Um, you know, there are, you know, only so many people who can afford to put up the money that allows you to operate as a staker in the system validating transactions. There are, you know, big exchanges that hold huge amounts of ether that will be potentially in a position to kind of help dictate the staking process. And so there's a concern that the government could lean on those sorts of entities and that that could prove a kind of roadblock toward this like vision of absolute decentralization that really kind of powers crypto. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, well, that's interesting. And you've also you've also mentioned the environmental impacts. I feel like you know, year after year for anyone who is detracting or, you know, kind of anti-crypto, this is kind of near the top. You know, there's there's the kind of scammy side of, of crypto that people point to. There's also the environmental impact. And uh, this seems to be at least, uh, from my understanding, a step in the right direction. Explain why this is so different from an environmental standpoint. Yeah, so it goes back to that distinction between proof of work and proof of stake. In proof of work, you have all these computers running, consuming huge amounts of electricity. In proof of stake, you can think of it more like a lottery than a race. You know, computers are selected right. at random to validate transactions versus competing to do so. And so that requires much, much less electricity. Um, some estimates put it at uh, over 99% less. Um, and so that's wow. a huge step forward for the crypto community, which, you know, people have criticized for years because of its energy costs. Yeah, well, and, and not just, you know, Ethereum, uh, Bitcoin also falls into this category, still operates on a proof of work system. Is there any chance or any likelihood, you know, when when one uh, player in a space and I realize, you know, nobody owns and controls Ethereum necessarily, but when one entity in a space does something and proves that it can happen, uh, often that can motivate others to kind of follow suit. Bitcoin, I would imagine, you know, everyone would probably agree is kind of the biggest, biggest player in the room, but uh, still on the proof of work system. Could this incentivize, could this be an example that uh, other cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin mm -hmm. might follow in the footsteps of? Um, I think it's unlikely that Bitcoin would would switch to proof of stake. I mean, the people who are most invested in Bitcoin are kind of deeply ideologically committed to proof of work, argue that it's more secure and more and less centralized than proof of stake. Now you get people on the proof of stake side making the same arguments in favor of their system. So there are definitely kind of valid points on each side, but it would be a big surprise if, if Bitcoin were to switch over. And, and like you say, there's no Bitcoin incorporated that would power that. Right. It would really have to be a kind of... <laughs> community-wide consensus, which just seems um, uh, not really possible. Yeah, yeah, not likely. Uh, and then finally, um, 
is the cost that's associated with uh, transacting in crypto, let's say. Gas fees, uh, anyone who's ever kind of looked into trading crypto, buying into a certain crypto, there's always this associated, often anyways, there's this associated gas fee that uh, in some cases can be more than what is being purchased, right? And same, uh, same goes for Ethereum. Does this have any impact on those fees? Will this uh, you know, possibly lower the cost of doing, uh, doing, you know, transacting in crypto. So you're right. That's been one of the real barriers to Ethereum kind of catching on with the wider audience. It costs a lot of money to conduct a transaction in Ether, um, and and that's a big problem that the the Ethereum developers have appreciated for a long time. The merge won't solve it immediately. Um, but it does kind of lay the groundwork for future upgrades that will ideally happen over the coming months and years that will minimize fees. Um, and that and that could probably be that's probably an even more crucial step toward greater adoption than eliminating the environmental costs. Yeah. Well, we really appreciate you breaking down all of the complexities around the merge, the Ethereum merge. Thank you so much. David Yaffe Bellany, of course, writes for The New York Times. If people want to find you online. Where can they find you? Um, I'm on Twitter um, and at the New York Times website, so follow our, our work there. All right, right on. Thank you, David. We appreciate your time.